This is George Newbern, the voice of Superman, and you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming at DCAUReview.com and on your favorite podcast app. There is an alien among us. A superior being from a place called Krypton. Deep in the heart of the city, he watches for signs of danger. Ready to act on a moment's notice. His true name is Kal-El. You know him as Superman. Maybe you ladies haven't heard about me. The future of Metropolis is in the hands of the Man of Steel. Get up. He's gonna be busy. I said get up. Superman. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 156 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your hosts, Cal, and with me is my good friend, good brother, and the man that runs our Twitter page. That's right, it's Liam. Liam, welcome to the month of magic. That's right, Magic May is here. And we are kicking off a brand new month of reviews here. We're going to be jumping around a little bit, but we've got an uh, interesting one to kick it off with this week. That's right. We are uh, in the world of Superman, the animated series, and we are kicking it off with the first DCAU appearance of Dr. Fate. That is right, Dr. Fate. Uh, who, of course, we've actually already covered episodes that he's appeared uh, on which he's appeared. Uh, some of the Justice League Unlimited episodes, actually, our Month of Green Lantern episodes that we covered uh, uh, just a few months ago, uh, which, of course, you can hear in the archives at dcaureview.com. Uh, one of those episodes very pivotally featured uh, Doctor Fate, but uh, very interested to talk about his DCAU debut today with you, Liam, as we discuss the episode The Hand of Fate. Uh, before we get into that, as we do each and every week, we are going to have you read in your best announcer voice the IMDB official synopsis for this week's episode, which of course originally debuted on the Kids WB back on, get this, 11-11, make a wish, 1997, <laughs> Liam. Uh, so, which puts us at just a little over... 24 years ago, coming up on the 25-year anniversary, not too far uh, in, into the distant future here. Uh, but uh, as we get into that, Liam, go ahead and read us our official IMDb synopsis. That's right, and this is for the episode The Hand of Fate, which was written by Hilary J. Bader and Stan Berkowitz, directed by Dan Reba, with music by Shirley Walker, and animation by Coco slash Dong Yang. And that synopsis reads as such. When an evil demon is unleashed, Superman attempts to enlist the aid of the now disinterested wizard superhero, Dr. Fate. Wizard superhero. That is it. That is what they say. I see. Never heard him referred to quite that way before. As the wiz- It's like with those old-timey names that they gave superheroes. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the uh, the Invincible Iron Man, yes. you know, uh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox. No, yes. wait, that's, that's different. That's not a superhero. <laughs> uh, he is to me. But... The uh, Incredible Hulk, the wizard superhero, Dr. Fate. Okay. All right. Well, uh, as we always say, in a tale as t- old as time, Liam... The episode kicks off with a man who is robbing, I guess, an antique store or something. Sure. Uh, and uh, he is, I, I, if they explained what he, a museum, something, if, whatever it was he was robbing, I missed that that plot point. So uh, you guys can tweet us at DCAU Review if, if, you, if you need to send a correction in there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, this gentleman is robbing a, whatever this is, antique museum store and breaks a vase that contains, wouldn't you know it, an artifact uh, that has some strange writing on it. And as he's looking at it, the writing transforms into English, 
And uh, wouldn't you know it, he just takes that as his cue to repeat everything that is uh, is written on there, which includes uh, say this chant essentially, and you will you will call the power of Karkul. <laughs> I am power beyond your dreams. Call to me. Karkul come siva kol. Karkul come tamba say. Yeah, right. Singing Polly Wally Doodle all day. <gasps> Who's there? Control, we have an intruder in building three. Watch where you... <gasps> Help me! Get away from us! And, uh, he does. It thinks nothing of it, but then as he passes by a window, wouldn't you know it, his eyes are suddenly glowing green and his face is completely in shadow. So, uh, he runs away and has uh, some encounters with some, some individuals where doesn't make a whole lot of sense. People are cowering away from him. He <laughs> runs into a, uh, a dark alley where he transforms into the evil Karkul. And that, that means that, of course, Superman happens to be patrolling that evening and hears uh, the screams from various people and decides to come down and investigate. So he has his first interaction with Karkul. Yeah, so this is... I guess the most interesting note to mention in the story, beyond the obvious stuff of having another superhero show up, is that this is maybe the first episode that touches on Superman's vulnerability to magic. Um, so uh, he has this fight with Karkul, and he's holding his own, but he's he's clearly getting beat up more than he would from your average, even even another like super powered metahuman foe. Uh, that he's fought to this point in the series. It's kind of a whole... They could try to set up as this whole different animal, and he's kind of completely over in over his head. Um, so, and I think they do an okay job of that, but he, he's he's kind of fighting. He's still holding his own, and so Cargill uh, takes... Hap he happens to be knocked into the Daily Planet, uh, as as fate would have it, pun very much intended. <laughs> and uh, and so Cargill, in order to kind of end the fight with Superman, blasts him out and, and casts this spell that acts as a protection spell so that no one can get into the Daily Planet, and he sort of begins to transform it into this sort of villainous uh, demon hive <laughs> i and, guess and creates a, a portal down somewhere they of course were you know it's a, it's a children's show we're not going to say the words hell right or or i don't even know if they actually say the word demon at any point but uh but uh you know s from down there uh up start coming all of these strange creatures which begin to possess the denizens of the Daily Planet and, and transform them into these terrifying, horrible monsters. And we certainly got a lot to talk about with that stuff when it comes to uh, visuals a little bit later in the episode. But as far as the plot goes, Superman's kind of at his wit's end. He doesn't quite know what's going on. Uh, Thankfully, though, there's a there's a friendly young witch who happens to be watching that comes <laughs> up and gives Superman just the exposition that he needs. Yeah, but like... And we'll, we can get this in a second. Not Maybe not the right exposition, Correct. though? What do you think it is? Some kind of alien force field? I wish I... It's an encanter. You know, like a spell of protection? It's pretty awesome. Hey, behind the line, girlie. Wait. Who are you? My real name's Doris, but my elf friends call me Rainsong. Okay, Tink. Back to Neverland. That thing inside calls himself Karkle. Ever heard of him? Mm-hmm. I read about him in this book we sell down at my store, The Dancing Hobbit. It's that little place next to the coffee hut. What did the book say? About Karkle? Oh, he's bad. The worst. Seventh level lord of the inner pit. Seeks to transform all human life into his bestial demon slaves. So how are we supposed to deal with that? 
Well, if you'd give me a couple of hours, maybe I could get my white wig of Kevin together and... Never mind. I know someone who can help. Not not exposition that is valuable to us. Yeah. So she's just like, it's a protection spell. And they go, okay. And Superman's like, this guy says his name is Karkle. Do you know who that is? And she's like, yup. Yep. Bad. <laughs> and so he goes, I know just... And then Superman, out of nowhere, just goes, well, I know just who to call. And he flies off, leaving uh, Maggie Sawyer and Dan Turpin sort of confused. And, uh, and he goes and he arrives at the Tower of Fate. Uh, and he's... Is it outside of Metropolis, I guess? Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> unclear. Uh, completely unclear. But uh, he lands there where he is greeted by uh, Dr. Fate's wife, Inza, um, who welcomes him inside and heals his wounds, and then he is, he's taken to meet with uh, Dr. Fate out of costume, and Superman's kind of like, hey, let's go, we got, a, we got a problem here, I need your help. Uh, it's very clear, like, they've met and worked together before, but that sometime between that time and now, Dr. Fate has completely lost interest in helping with humanity. There's a line about how he's sort of immortal, and he's fought it's fought these forces for so long, and he sort of doesn't see the point because they just keep coming back. He has a Dr. Manhattan-esque dialogue where he just talks about being tired of of the, the battle between good and evil and how he's outside of that now. And This is my domain now, the metaphysical realm. I've moved beyond good and evil. But there are people trapped. I'm sorry. I truly am. Superman, you and I are alike, you know. We're masters of our destiny. Don't waste your life in endless battle as I did. Not when the universe beckons. You're wrong, Fate. We're nothing alike. Yeah, it's, it's very odd that Superman references and knows this person... That we've never seen before. Mm-hmm. We've not seen their other interaction. We even did so much as to look for tie-in uh, comic, right. perhaps, uh, references that th- this episode might have uh, canonically been related to. No, not that we know of. Nothing that we could we could f- find and see. We're just supposed to assume that at some point, these two guys met, worked together, and Superman went back to, to ask him for his help. And at this point, he's world-weary and has given up the mantle of Dr. Fate, essentially. Uh, which Superman is, is not pleased with, but decides that he just has to kind of continue into battle at this point alone. Uh, Inza does grant him what looks to be a magic olive. Uh, <laughs> we'll discuss that in visuals, I guess, or we don't have to. Nah. But a magic olive that allows him passage past the spell. And uh, then once he gets in inside, he uh, begins to take on Karkul and uh, the various different members of the Daily Planet who have gone through horrific transformations mm-hmm. from their human form into these demon-possessed Glen Marikami creatures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, as, uh, as this happens... Superman, of course, is being beat down. He has some success against some of these creatures, but ultimately is being restrained and appears to be uh, just seconds away from his demise as Karkul realizes that Superman is vulnerable to magic at this point. And uh, because we did see the first uh, one of the uh, in the first scene, uh, he strikes Superman and Superman bleeds. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we know that Superman definitely is vulnerable to this magic. Uh, so wouldn't you know it right at that time who bursts through, uh, but, uh, one Dr. Fate, he's decided to pick up the mantle of Dr. Fate again, and, uh, he's come to take on Karkul, but wouldn't you know it, that Butterfingers, <laughs> he's with, he, with him, he has the tablet that Karkul, d- uh, destroyed in the beginning, uh, 
thinking, uh, leading you to think that there was no hope now that this little tablet is that kind of contained, I guess, his spirit beforehand mm-hmm. was destroyed. Well, uh, Dr. Fate in a very like comic booky explanation explains that once something is made, it cannot be unmade. Sure. And so then he begins to uh, chant and try and get Carcol back, and he drops the uh, he drops the tablet down the hole to. The down there place, sure. The bad place. The bad place. Weird. Correct. Yes. That's. Hey, they should. They should do a TV show about <laughs> that. Well, and then as soon as that happens, uh, Superman is sent uh, chasing after the tablet into the bad place. Thankfully, uh, I guess the bad place is just an infinite hole in the ground because he was able to catch up to it after going through many, many, many demons or flying stingrays, whatever they are, <laughs> catches it. Comes back up and just in time because uh, Karkul at that point is just about ready to defeat Dr. Fate. But Superman gains the upper hand, Liam. That's right. Uh, yeah, so that's the, the they are able to team up and Superman has the tablet and Fate does the chant. And they in fact, uh, they in fact uh, trap Karkul back in this prepared tablet and... And all is right with the world. All of the demons are magically uh, teleported back down the hole, and they're all ripped of the, off of their hosts. That's right. And all of the uh, all of the damage done to the Daily Planet is is, is magically reversed as well. It's a very Phantom Menace style ending, <laughs> uh, uh, where the the big bad gets is is killed, and so everybody just uh, everybody all the all the underlings just kind of shut down at that point. But yep. uh, but yeah. Um, so, and then there's a little kind of tacked on thing at the end where Superman asks Dr. Fate why he came back, and Dr. Fate said it's because he was inspired by Superman to, uh, who, knowing that he was probably going to die and didn't have a chance to stop Karkle by himself, still went back to try, and that sort of inspired Fate to, to keep fighting, because it, it made him understand that while the forces of evil may never stop, that there will also be forces of good always rising to meet them, and so... Uh, that's that's sort of our end, and then Doctor Fate rides again. Even though, again, this is the first time we've ever seen Doctor Fate, so <laughs> we see him. So that we we can start to get scores here in a second. But that's sort of the crux of this. There's two main things. One, how does Superman know this guy? Right. Not it's not not even like a throwaway dialogue about like you know some other magic threat that nope that Superman was dealing with. It's just established that they know each other. All right. Agreed. And second is, it's hard to do a thing where you introduce a character and he's already like the world weary retired version of himself. Sure. Um, but I think it would have been. But the way to fix some of this, I think, is so you like we said. There's the scene where this goth girl, the Wiccan, whatever she is, shows up and is dropping all this exposition about Karkle and protection spells. Have her say. I, you know, there's legends of this wizard on the outskirts of town that lives in this tower, and no one ever gets in or out of it, and it's this, we think it's this, you know, legendary yep. magical force for, you know, that uh, that once battled Karkul a hundred years ago, or yep. whatever. And then Superman goes, okay, whatever, I'll check this out. And right. then he goes there, and he meets the guy. And I think he, maybe you could even still have him like not want to get involved at first. Right, that makes perfect sense. He um, could just explain, Superman, I've been doing this for thousands of years. I don't have any interest in continuing in this fight. Right. That's all he has to say. Right, but once you establish that he and Superman have met and theoretically teamed up to fight evil before, it's like, what changed in the last 18 months or whatever since they last hung out that... He got so much more world weary than he was. It's a biz- it was in a the grand scheme of things. If he's this immortal character that's been around for centuries, yeah, it's a bizarre. It was a bizarre story choice to make these guys already and uh, already know each other. And I understand it's a twenty-two minute episode. They can't go into the full backstory of Doctor Fate. You didn't want to do a straight introduction. It's not an origin story of Doctor right. Fate. Okay, that's fine, but. You all, I, I think you just wrote a perfectly <laughs> acceptable answer for how to do this and not make this feel like, well, we're just supposed to assume these guys were friends already. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Were, do you think that they planned on them having a, a, a prequel episode at some point Maybe. where we learned about this this interaction? Or if not, if not, then it makes zero sense because there's no payoff to it. It also makes the very end where he 
all of a sudden decides he's going to fight and this conversation with Superman is like, well, you were at, interacting with Superman and Superman hasn't changed. He's still the, he right. still cared about humanity and was willing to sacrifice himself from the last time that you guys right. interacted. You've forgotten about that. It's just that like, and, and I think, I think that that like world weary, tired superhero uh, persona has, we've, you know, we've seen it as I, as I said, it's the Doctor Manhattan type mm-hmm. thing where you have this all of this power and you're just so bored with it, or you know, or you're a superhero that has seen everything from the start, and at this point you're just so dis disenfranchised from everything that you're going to remove yourself from it and you mm-hmm. have no interest, and then they call you back in at some point. We've seen that done in various sure, sure. forms of comic books. It, a lot. Yeah, so, absolutely. But it, and it's okay. It's a trope that works. Mm-hmm. However, in this case, I I don't understand the point of it because it's not a character that we knew about before. There's not an explanation of where this interaction comes from, unless they were planning on unless this whole season because there are a lot of crossovers during this season of Superman yes. the animated series. Unless this whole season was a pitch to try and get them to do spinoff shows of Doctor Fate and Aquaman and. Uh, who else is the in this Flash. season? The Flash. Uh, if, unless that's the case, I, I don't understand why you would do that. And then maybe you could have told that in a spinoff show or something. Right. Like, the, you know, the first time that they interacted. But otherwise, it, I, it serves no purpose. Like you said, it's I, I did not like this episode. This is an episode that I saw a <laughs> lot growing up. Uh, you know, we, we talked about it. It was one that I felt like was in heavy rotation on, on the kids' WB. So... Uh, I have other various issues uh, with with other things, but the plot in and of itself feels very rushed. It feels very anticlimactic. You kind of can see it a mile coming from a mile away that Doctor Fate's going to come in and save it, and he end, ends up not even saving the day anyway. Superman has to save him <laughs> from saving the day because well, he because he's got butterfingers. Well, we have to remember whose name's on the marquee. You know, the, the, you know? <laughs> <laughs> can't let a you know a guest come into the territory and 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 get too much shine. You know? <laughs> um, but now that yeah, that is kind of a weird. Yeah, his big thing is he comes back, he brings the tablet. Which immediately gets knocked out of his hand down the hole, which Superman then has to go get, and then he does the chant, and that's really his contribution. He doesn't show off a lot of like you know cool magic spells or anything. Even some of the you know sort of lower like I feel like in in Justice League he's just like a yellow energy beam guy right. <laughs> a lot of the time, but even that like we don't even really see him do that. Like he kind of does one one or two little magic magic things but he's kind of immediately like we said the tablet's knocked out of his hand and he gets tied up by by Karkle and is sort of immediately <laughs> and there's no explanation of Karkle is Karkle gonna expand beyond the daily planet once he gets like like Not he clear. turns everybody into demons and then he just kind of hangs out there until Superman arrives like yeah. he doesn't try to expand his empire at all from there like it just doesn't seem like there's much tension there either because usually at this point there's like a there's tension between oh no if if unless they stop him in this time frame he's going to expand and you know the whole world is going to be turned into right. his demons or whatever and it doesn't ever really feel like that and then there's this weird giant monster that chases superman out of the hole when he gets the <laughs> tablet that is never followed up upon it just chases him out and superman flies out of the hole and that's the end of that i, I don't know uh it's a very weirdly paced episode it's a very weird story I am not a fan of this episode. I, I'm glad that my feelings of not loving this episode story-wise uh, still ring true for my childhood watching of this. Uh, I'll get into my plot score here because of that. Uh, not not a fan of this episode. One of one of my least favorite Superman animated series episodes maybe ever. Uh, for that reason, I gave plot a 3 out of 10. What about you? Wow. Yeah, I'm not too far off. I went 5 out of 10. I think it's, uh, like I said, I I think what we've already talked about is kind of my major issues with it. I do like, you know, because I'm uh, such a Superman fan, I think I like the idea of him inspiring Dr. Fate, who is so, again, it doesn't necessarily track because of (laughs) the fact that they've apparently already met before, so it's not like he wasn't aware of who Superman was or what he did on a daily, weekly basis at this point, but... But I still like that, and I still like that little bit at the end where where Superman hands him the helmet, and and they kind of, you know, and the 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 fight the fight marches on. Like I, I appreciated that enough that I like I said it's definitely not one of my favorite episodes we've uh, we've reviewed from a, from a story perspective certainly, but 
yeah. Overall, definitely not a uh, not a home run. Probably not even a single. <laughs> I'd say it's a strikeout. But, <laughs> but uh, th- there we have it. All right, Liam. Moving on to our next category, and uh, in my opinion, a spoiler alert, probably the strongest category. Uh, of the day, and mm-hmm. that is going to be visuals and animation. Uh, so let's talk about that. Already alluded to it a little bit with uh, what we believe to be some some pretty interesting Glenn Mirakami esque designs. Uh, not certain if it was, but more than likely he was working on the show at the time. So more than likely some of his designs for some of these demon esque creatures. Uh, what did you have written down as far as visuals were concerned? Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the long and short of it from the very first moment when the guy is sort of begins to be possessed by, by Karkle and he's... Great just, horror movie tropes. Oh, yeah. Like, he like he's first he's just like, ah, this is nothing and starts to walk away and then he sees his own reflection in, like, a display case and he sees that his skin has turned black and he set, just has these green eyes and he, you know, runs out and begins to kind of run up to different people walking on the street, you know, begging them to help him and they're all terrified of him and... And then he sort of, uh, you know, expands into the full Carcal costume, his clothes rip, and just like his jacket becomes like this hooded cloak that Carcal is draped in. And Carcal the- itself, it's like he, ha- he has one sort of normal looking hand, but that has like a second arm coming out of the- his bicep. And then his other hand is looks like almost like an axe or something. And then he has all these tentacles, plus he has like pink tentacles coming out of his mouth. It's a very... Very striking. Neon green eyes. Yes, it's a very striking. That guy never returns, design. by the way. Even when 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 Karkul gets uh, sent back to the, the bad place, no, uh, he does. He, the villain, yeah, the he, bad trans- guy comes yeah back. he transforms I, back. I missed that. Whew. Okay, good. Yeah, when Karkul is disappeared, the the guy is back. Okay, whew. all right. Never mind that. Then. <laughs> uh, but yeah, visually, uh, it it's it's a striking episode. The energy that uh, that Karkul shoots out of his the magic i guess the mm-hmm. magic energy that comes out of him and then the eventual like force field that he puts around the daily planet is also this neon green uh color uh, there's a, lots of bright colors mm-hmm. uh, on that side of things i thought also that the backgrounds uh once carco has taken over the daily planet uh, they cut to Superman going to the uh, the Tower of Fate, and then they cut back. And meanwhile, everything inside the Daily Planet has transformed into this like Scooby Doo esque, like <laughs> warped, like that. Every everything is warped and sort of crooked, like a, in a very like Scooby Doo horror film esque type creepy vibe <laughs> and everything has this this neon green glow mm-hmm. to it uh this undertone glow to it and um that's just the backgrounds and stuff like that for right. that scene yeah. but then the actual the actual characters themselves there's some there's some interesting transformations we see as we mentioned the sort of stingray demon things that are flying out of this pit uh, we also get uh, some three-eyed monster demon things that walk backwards. Yes. Uh, like their legs are pointed one direction, but they walk in that direction. Uh, and then I, maybe the most horrific transformations come from uh, Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane, who are at the Daily Planet. We didn't mention this, but they're at the Daily Planet, of course, when mm-hmm. all of this goes down. And Jimmy is just determined to get killed but more importantly (laughs) get that photograph for the front page in the meanwhile right and uh he transforms my biggest disappointment is while lois when she transforms she got to keep her dark black hair Mm -hmm. just as her designation for this is lois but jimmy didn't get to keep his orange mullet (laughs) i think that that design with that weird (laughs) creepy demon with the tentacles thing with a with an orange mullet would have been just like perfect i think it would i would have had to have given the 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 score a perfect 10 out of 10 at that point Mm. for an orange mulleted demon (laughs) creature with tentacles but uh but what did you have as far as 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 the rest of visuals yeah so the other things that i pointed out was so they 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 use the the dr fate symbol and i thought in some creative Mm -hmm. ways um the ank ank and kh something like that (laughs) ank The cross with the little hook on the top. Right, correct. Um, so, like when uh, when Superman first arrives at the Tower of Fate, uh, that's like the door is in that shape, and uh, Inza kind of walks out of it, and then they go inside, and you have again some pretty cool backgrounds as they're walking through the Tower of Fate, and uh, you know Superman points to, to to the helmet which is behind this glass case, and 
they go into a room which Cal you pointed out sort of looks like the uh, X Men movies uh, version of Cerebro. It's just this big room with a single platform that you can kind of walk out onto, and and then he sort of is is looking out into the universe as as uh, Superman kind of tries to reason with them, and then yeah, that the definitely those creatures uh, that that come out of the portal as as well as uh, the transformations, the lowest one especially where. She sort of she gets taken over. It sort of comes from her feet, and then she drops down, and sort of, and sort of her head is down. And as the you can see her start to transform, and then her head picks up, and it's transformed into this hideous monster, and kind of looks right into the camera. I thought, yeah, that was some really great uh, horror movie style elements to it, and just some really really creative, creepy designs for uh, for all the different monsters and. Yeah, I, I think other than that, I mean, the Doctor Fate design itself, I mean, this is almost literally the exact design we see in, in Justice League and JLU later on. Uh, colors are a little bit uh, more muted in this version. It's For not sure. quite as vibrant a blue, and it's not quite as, like, a royal gold as it is in that series, but it's pretty much, the, you know, straight up the same design for both Doctor Fate and uh, Inza when they appear, so... Um, yeah, overall, I really, really loved the visuals of this episode, and for those reasons... Ironically, uh, given the how much we didn't necessarily love the plot, I gave visuals a perfect 10. Out of 10. Wow. Uh, I'm a couple notches lower with that. I went with that an 8 out of 10 for, for visuals. I think mm -hmm. they are strong. I think maybe the most visually interesting or memorable shot is the, uh, the classic Dr. Fate uh, kind of hand outstretched at a little bit of an angle towards the screen. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you get the perspective of his hand towards you and then, you know, the helmet in the background, uh, seeing the helmet in the dome also, it's a very, that's a yeah. very classic Dr. Fate, mm -hmm. uh, element. You know, we've seen that across various different, uh, forms of DC, uh, both in the comics, we've saw it on Smallville. We've mm -hmm. seen it in, I believe it shows up in Constantine briefly. Yeah. And, uh... As well as perhaps the uh, I have not watched it, but I think Doctor Fate's being introduced in the Star Girl series as well. So yeah, it's 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 across various different platforms. So the the helm the Doctor Fate helmet is is pretty iconic in and of itself. Uh, if you if you are a DC fan, so seeing that on the screen and then the final visual, even though I, it doesn't make you know we I didn't love the story portion or or how it's written into the script, but ending the episode sort of uh, Superman representing the hel his helmet mm -hmm. to Doctor Fate as he sits and rests, and uh, it sort of just focuses on the helmet. Everything fades out except the eyes of the helmet. Uh, which are which are you know which are enlightened there. So mm -hmm. uh, a neat visual, neat way to end the episode. Um, it, it's it is the strongest part of the episode without a doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of interesting things to see. Lots of which is definitely needed in my opinion based on what the story is. Um, but uh, yeah, great for you giving it a, a perfect score there. It is very very strong. And uh, definitely the thing that I that I most noticed and uh, I felt was most noteworthy as well. Yeah, the only other note I had is, as you kind of mentioned, this green energy that uh, that Karkle exudes. It's, it's it doesn't it's not just like a lightning bolt or an energy blast that we see in these shows a lot. It's it's like smoke almost mm -hmm. or or something. It kind of surrounds and envelops like the police cars at the beginning, and then when it sort of creates the force field, it's this kind of constantly moving almost the beginnings of like a tornado or something uh, surrounding the Daily Planet. So I thought that was kind of a clever effect and isn't just like a green bubble that they're yeah. they're inside of. And, or an energy blast. Yes. And the and the green slime that Karkul uh, leaves out on the ground every time he's walking, <laughs> I also thought was a nice little, just a little extra ew for your, uh, there for you your creepy monster character. Love it, absolutely. All right, Liam, let's move on to our next category, which is going to be music. And uh, this week's music was done by Shirley Walker. Mm -hmm. Shirley Walker. Um, I got to say, I was a little bit disappointed that there wasn't a more prominent Dr. Fate theme. There is one that does come in a little bit when he makes his, his triumphant appearance uh, towards the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You continue to surprise me, but as I said, you don't have the tools to defeat me. But I do.
fate. I thought our dealings had come to an end long ago. No such luck, I'm afraid. What magic do you have that's powerful enough to defeat me in my own land? The artifact of Norton. I destroyed it. What has been made can never be unmade. Lorta Kum Karkum. Lorta Terra. Ah! I think it's more that this episode didn't have enough opportunity for that theme to kind of stick because he is such a stick in the mud plot wise right. at the beginning. Um, so there was no need for a triumphant Dr. Fate theme to come in when Superman visits him in the, in the tower of fate. Right. So it's not needed until that final scene where he makes his triumphant appearance. And then it sort of plays again as the episode fades out, but it wasn't to me, it wasn't strong enough or memorable enough, uh, in the way that we know that a lot of the, 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 uh, guest star themes have been mm -hmm. or even later on in, in some of the Justice League episodes or Justice League Unlimited episodes where they decided to kind of write write in uh, new pieces for these these guest starring characters. Uh, what did you have as far as music was concerned? Yeah, I thought the two uh, best musical moments are probably that, that first fight between Superman and Karkul in Metropolis. It's at night and we just kind of at first there's not really any music we just see superman flying through the the city and then he uh you know his super hearing goes off and he and he hears some sort of commotion down in metropolis and he sees Karkul and their fight i thought had some pretty good uh some pretty good dramatic music to it and then i i liked the music when Karkul takes over the daily planet it gets like real ominous and and sort of dramatic and and terrifying as as he begins to sort of warp it and <laughs> Where's your page one, Jimmy? We live to see it. The music when the when the the Daily Planet uh, reporters start transforming and stuff, I think it's, there's some great little stings there of like some dramatic kind of shrill shri uh, strings and stuff like that that you would you would expect in a sort of horror movie esque uh, moment that they were going for there. So yeah, not nothing uh, nothing stood out to me as great. Great, I did like the Doctor Fate uh, music that came in when he sort of appears at the at the end of the episode, but yeah, unfortunately we didn't really get to hear that. Uh, at least not played in the sort of variety of ways that we get to hear uh, some of the other hero themes, um, say like the Green Lantern theme uh, or or the Blackhawks theme, th certainly. But uh, definitely some cool stuff there. But I ended up settling on a six out of ten for music. Yeah, uh, I am right there with you. I gave it five out of ten. It's it's just that you know I I just don't think that the music played enough. Uh, of an importance. I think with the guest star, I, I almost feel like it's mandatory to have that, that memorable theme at mm -hmm. least. And uh, for whatever reason, I think I ultimately, I don't think it was the, it was Shirley Walker's fault. I, I would say it's probably the, the plot. And, and as I already stated, like not having, not having the point to use it very often. So right. uh, that, that made it a little bit less memorable maybe than some of those other themes. So uh, just kind of middle of the road, didn't harm things, but I didn't feel like it left a, enough of an impact to, uh, to grant a higher score. Fair enough. All right, Liam. Well, that will bring us to our final category of the day, and that is going to be our voice acting. Uh, pretty big cast for this week's uh, voice actors. Let's talk about today's players and uh, the rest of our voice cast. Yeah, we have a few kind of minor uh, returning characters who we would know. Uh, Dorian Harewood as uh, Ron Troop, as well as I think he also voices a cop earlier in the episode. Uh, of course, uh, Rhodey uh, slash War Machine from the 90s Iron Man Hashtag show. Hashtag my War Machine. That's right. That's right. Uh, as well as uh, Riley on The Forgotten and, and several other uh, DCA voices across time. And speaking of familiar DCAU voices, voicing the sort of uh, goth Wiccan uh, girl who dumps uh, dumps some exposition for, for Superman, uh, one Cree Summer... And boy, howdy, is it very obvious that it's Cree Summer. Right? <laughs> I was like, wow, that's Cree Summer. Yeah, sure is. Like, no no doubts, except no substitutes. But it was, it was funny to hear her in there. And um, then uh, 
we, we have some of our main players. We have David Kaufman as Jimmy a little bit. Um, we have Dan Delaney as Lois, but that's maybe one thing, and that is probably another plot note more than a... But I would have liked to have seen more of specifically Lois Lane interacting with Karkle, like, because I think that could have been funny. Um, <laughs> just because of her, her sort of wit and, you know, refusal to be afraid of anything. Um, that that could have been fun. Because, yeah, Dan, Dan Delaney and David Kaufman are both in this episode, but they have very little to do. Yeah. So it's mostly this them kind of reacting to stuff, and then and then they get transformed into monsters at the end, so... Um, and then, yeah, we have our our our, uh, our sort of main guest actors of the piece. We have uh, Jennifer Lien as Inza, uh, who folks might know from one of the Star Trek shows. Are we getting uh, any Star Trek spoilers this no, week? No, I've never seen. I've never. I've barely seen any Star Trek, but I've definitely not seen whatever Voyager was. All right, all right. So I, you, I, I, Star Trek spoilers are free this right. week. No, no. Star Other, Trek unless spoiler. you consider it a spoiler that this actress was in that show. Oh, good point. Spoiler uh, for alert. more than one episode, so she doesn't die in the in the first episode. Okay, good to know. In, in case, in case that's a spoiler. <laughs> but uh, yeah, other than that, we have uh, we have uh, George Del Hoyo as uh, Doctor Fate. Um, he's there. Yeah, he's fine. Um, the healing balm should do its work. What made you change your mind? You. Something I said? Something you did. You went back. You didn't stand a chance, but you went back. Till then, I thought it was only the forces of evil that wouldn't give up. I was wrong. Your helmet. I'll be needing it. Yeah, he's fine in the first thing. Like you said, a very monotone... I honestly think he probably would have done it if they ever did an animated Watchmen, which I'm sure they'll get around to eventually. Uh, he might, uh, uh, I believe he's still alive, uh, might not be a bad choice for Dr. Manhattan, quite honestly, because it's very, very bereft of emotion, I think intentionally. But then when he's Dr. Fate, you know, proper superhero at the end, when he's been inspired by Superman, there isn't like a gr dramatic change in sort of the inflection of his voice. It's kind of still pretty even-keeled, monotone. Yeah, I, I think I'm a fan of the recasting that they did for Justice League mm -hmm. Unlimited, if I'm being honest. I get that he's supposed to be world weary and this is supposed to be, you know, he's very exhausted and almost removed, but I, it felt very wooden in his delivery. And, and I, I, I wasn't sold that that was necessarily what his, what his goal was in that performance. So I just was not, not a fan of his, his performance as, as Dr. Fate here. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, actually, I think, uh, Jennifer Leanna's Inza is actually way better in that, because there's the moment where he's like, well, you've just sent him off to to, to his death. And she's like, well, what do you care? Right. <laughs> I was like, sick burn, Inza. Got him. <laughs> Get him. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was a good line. And then, yeah. So it, so as we get to our, our final actor, our final guest actor here, we have Ted Levine uh, as uh, Karkle, who folks might know from Silence of the Lambs. He was also in Shutter Island with uh, Leo okay. uh, a few years ago. Um I think he's doing a fine job, but it's hard to tell because they put such an echoey voice effect on him that it's almost hard to hear what he's saying. You got a real Bane from the Dark Knight Rises <laughs> type thing happening here in that they decided to put such a weird effect on his voice that it is impossible to understand what he's saying. I literally... And I remember that being an issue that I had as a child. And I think we this is one that we had taped off of Kids WB at one point. Mm -hmm. So I thought my, I guess maybe my thought was that this is, it was a result of just being on a bad videotape. Like it was a bad recording. But no, we were watching this, the, the remastered version on HBO <laughs> Max. Uh, not a plug for HBO Max because we're not sponsored by them. But we would be. Absolutely. For the right price. If you're listening, HBO Max. Uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful streaming service. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's so it's not. It's incredibly difficult to understand what it took me a, maybe like a second longer than normal human conversation to register everything that he said in so, in a couple of the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it the echo and the the voice modulation that they put on his voice 
was a very poor choice. You are strong for a mortal, but a mortal is all you are. You don't have the tools to defeat me. Because I don't think... I think they altered his voice... Uh, the depth of his voice and then added an echo and then added an echo to the echo. So it's not, it's very hard for me to discern whether or not this is a good performance or not based on the fact that they screwed up his voice modulation so much. I would almost want to give voice acting an incomplete grade this yeah. week. And it's not, like I said, I'm sure he's a, obviously he's been uh, all of these people in great actors. And I will actually mention that, um, the uh, the voice for Doctor Fate when he's wearing the helmet also has yes an, ef- an echoey effect on it yes so like that last scene when he shows up and it's Carkle being like Fate I thought we had finished our business centuries ago or whatever like I I was listening very intently <laughs> so I kind of got it yeah but if you're doing anything else if you if you're reading or you're on your phone or you're you have a dog or kids or anything else in the world another person is in the room with you you're probably going to miss like half of the dialogue in that scene alone not to mention probably every other scene that Karkle is in yeah agreed like and it shouldn't be that hard to like where you should have to parse it out or like change your audio settings on your TV <laughs> to put it in like oh maybe if I have to do the one that like turns down music and amplifies voice to be able to understand what's happening or I have to put closed captioning on right you should not have to do that uh, and again it's no fault of the actor that's clearly a post production decision that was just a bad one um, so and I will say out of all of these things. I think this is a really good episode from Tim Daly for the most part. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have a lot to do, but... Mm-hmm. Like, the scene where he kind of goes to plead with Dr. Fate to help him, and when Dr. Fate tells him he's not going to help, and Superman's just complete inability to wrap his mind around ever giving up when there are people out there that need help, I think is great. And Tim Daly does a great job with that scene, especially. But, it's again, it's hard to rate this because of that. Um, so I ended up settling on a six out of ten for voice acting. Uh, again, I I think Tim Daly's great, and it's very possible that uh, Ted Levine does a great job as Carkle. It's just very hard to understand him. So, yeah, I would I'm gonna co-sign that and say that uh, as much of not a fan as I was of of George Del Hoyo's Doctor Fate, um, you know I I think that Tim Daly more than made up for that. I think it. I think everybody else in their minor roles, I think, does do a great job. I thought Dana Delaney was fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought David Kaufman was fine. Uh, we get a little bit of Joseph Bologna uh, mm-hmm. comes in as, as Dan Turpin and, and Joanna Cassidy as, as Maggie Sawyer. Absolutely. I thought both of them did a fine supporting job. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cree Summer was a was a even though it's so weird to hear <laughs> that voice as anything but Max. She's very funny though. She's very funny. The character that she picked is very funny. The interaction there's a split second comedy <laughs> moment where uh, she she returns uh, to the Daily Planet with the rest of her Wiccan crew and they interrupt Dan Turpin who has to just who just is so done with the situation. <laughs> Great. Hey, mister. We're ready. Where do you want us to chant? Oi. Just a funny little, like, split-second clip, but mm-hmm. uh, very, very funny. Uh, but, yeah, it, you know, I, I think the rest of the rest of the supporting cast is is does well. It's just it's it's impossible to tell and grade whether or not Karkle's voice was done because of the, the terrible decision to put this over immodulation on on the character so right. uh yeah for all those reasons i also gave the exact same score six out of ten um it's it's fine it's it's fine it's it, <laughs> it, but i i 
don't think that they helped. I wonder if this modulation was not on this episode, if I wouldn't have given the plot such a terrible score. Because then now you're making me have to like <laughs> put in more effort than I usually do to, ob- right. to observe and enjoy this episode. Because you decided to put this weird, wonky effect yes. on the villain's voice. Yeah, no, I hear you. I definitely think that's... that. That can be part of it. One, one. Uh... Don't give me homework for a twenty-two minute children's <laughs> cartoon, okay? Right. We shouldn't have to. Be, it's one thing, right? If if I'm not paying attention and I have to rewind the episode, that's on me. Right. If I'm paying attention and have to rewind it because I just can't understand what the person's saying, that's on you know the post production and the audio engineering. So yeah, bad. They get a they get an F grade for this. They get a zero. <laughs> audio engineering zero for this week. <laughs> Uh, if that was a score, not a negative, uh, I could have given it a negative bonus point for that, but, <laughs> but I'm not going to, there uh, has, there's only been, I think maybe one, ep- one or two episodes in, in the show's history. What the hell? I'm giving it a <laughs> negative bonus point. That's right. We're taking yeah. the sound effect for that? I don't think we, uh, did I play the, the bonus point in reverse maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe that's what I do. We'll find if, out. If not, that's what I'm doing. All right. Uh, negative bonus point to sound engineering here because boy, oh boy, did they screw this episode up. Oh man. Uh, I love it. All right, Liam. Well, now that we have a negative bonus point, that it's time to get our final scores together here. Uh, totaling everything up uh, with the one point deducted for the sound engineering, I end up with a surprisingly high uh, 21 out of <laughs> 40. <laughs> yeah, and I think we can definitely tell that I just didn't didn't dislike this one quite as much as you did. I think mostly our plot and visuals scores made up for this uh, this dramatic difference, despite the fact that I don't think we disagreed all that much. Uh, but my final score ends up being uh, a bit higher at 27 out of 40. Disagreement alarm, I think, needs to be broken <laughs> out because, whoa! Um, yeah, okay. So, now... so. We didn't talk about it at the at the the start, but yeah. the whole idea behind the month of of magic and magic May, whatever you want to call it, is we're doing this theme where it, obviously the characters, the main characters of the episodes, are going to be these characters with magical powers. We wrapped mm-hmm. up last month with Zatanna. This month we're kicking it off with the Hand of Fate. We've got some more episodes that we'll cover in the next few weeks, as we'll preview in just a little bit here. But where? Where does this one lie as far as rewatchability? Because <laughs> technically it's the introduction to Dr. Fate into the yeah. animated series. But as we said, he's alluded to have working with Superman prior to this. So it's really not the introduction of Dr. Fate to right. the DCAU. Yeah, I think it's a skip. I think the, and we'll, uh, you know, spoiler alert, we'll be reviewing it this month. But his reintroduction in Justice League, I think they do a fine job of reestablishing who the character is, who Inza is. Like, if anything, they probably give you more because, like, they tell you his name is Kent Nelson, which they never actually say in this episode, right? And things like that. So, uh, yeah, I would say you can you could probably skip this one. Like I said, from a visual standpoint, it's very fun, and it, you know the artistry on display from the background designs all the way to the character designs to the animation teams. Like, everyone did a good job, and it's just a shame that the script and some weird voice effects kind of bring it down so dramatically. Yeah, I I agree with you. This is definitely a skip. I think score alone tells you that, but... Uh, it's it's definitely not not a must see, especially because of the weird way that they introduce the character. I would much rather come in cold, not knowing who Doctor Fate is in the DCAU, mm-hmm. and uh, and his reintroduction to the Justice League, as we'll as we'll talk about in a few weeks, uh, is I think a fine introduction to the character and does does the character a little bit more justice uh, than this episode. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. This is a skip. It agreed. All right, Liam, well, that will begin to wrap this week's episode up. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Don't forget, if you subscribe to us on a podcast app and it allows you to leave a review, such as Apple Podcasts, do us a favor. Leave us a five-star review. Let us know and the good people at home know what you like about us. Even if you've already left a review, uh, thank you, first of all. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you can actually go back and leave another review. Uh, Apple lets you kind of leave unlimited reviews, so if If you have done that before, thank you. If you're feeling kind and you want to help us out uh, and you like what we're doing here, go ahead and do that for us. It helps us out a lot. 
Uh, you can also support the podcast by grabbing a shirt, a hat, mug, a sticker. Uh, you can head over to dcaureview.com, click on the store tab at the top. That will take you to our shop and you can pick up uh, one of those to support us. Don't forget, you can also support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, which is, uh, we're, we're a part of the Pod Tower YouTube channel with uh, our good friends at Tim Talk and our good friends at Watchtower Database. So go over and subscribe to us there. That's another way to support us if you don't have the uh, monetary means, Liam, which not a lot of people do these days, understandably Absolutely. so. So if you can't support us monetarily, we get it. Uh, but hey, go. Uh, you can go ahead and press that subscribe button over there at Pod Tower. That helps us out a lot or leave us a review uh, either way. Uh, also, we love hearing from you, so you can go ahead and leave us some feedback. Uh, you can tweet us at DCAU Review. Liam runs the Twitter page over there. We have a great time interacting uh, with people that uh, also happen to love DC Comics and DCAU uh, content. We also have our Instagram at DCAU Review. Go ahead and follow us on there if you'd like to. And uh, Liam, I guess it's time to start previewing next week's episode. That's right, Cal, and we are, of course, as we have been saying, it is the month of magic, Magic May. We are continuing with that theme with a often discussed and disagreed upon episode between the two of us. If you've been listening for a while, you know how rare it is that we disagree on anything, much less an entire episode's worth of content. But uh, we'll be interesting to see how we uh, how we score and uh, so chat about this week's episode, another magic-focused episode featuring a character we just recently talked about, Zatanna, Wonder Woman, the villainous Cersei, and more, as we will be finally reviewing the Justice League Unlimited episode, This Little Piggy. I cannot wait to fight you. I, I have been, uh, full disclosure, every time we review JLU, Cal brings up we sh that we haven't reviewed This Little Piggy <laughs> And I'm just like, I'm not ready for it yet. <laughs> well, I'm not ready for it yet. Ready but or not, here it, we come, It's pal. Magic May, and then we can't we can't not cover an episode that features all these You've magic You've run characters. away from your destiny long <laughs> enough. We are, we, are, we are going to enjoy this. It's going to be a great Saturday. I cannot wait to spend it with you, Liam. Uh, but until then, I'm Cal. And I'm Liam. And we will talk to you on the very next episode of the DCAU. Goodbye.